Bonsoir à vous, à vous tous. Hello everybody and welcome to the fifth and last episode of the um, Ariel series, uh, which started um, a month ago on November the 12th. Bienvenue à tous pour le cinquième et dernier épisode de la série Ariel et veuillez nous excuser pour le, pour le petit retard. Avant de lancer ce dernier séminaire sur les questions de circulation nationale et transnationale et de réception publique de l'œuvre littéraire de Moali, séminaire Tackling the Questions of the Circulation and the Reception of Moali's Work, both nationally and internationally, qui sera à la fois en français et en anglais, selon les intervenants et les questions que vous poserez. Uh, we'll be switching from English to French and vice versa, depending on the participants and your questions. Uh, we were hoping that you'd be able to post questions on YouTube, um, which might be a bit more difficult, but do post them uh, on Teams, please. Avant de lancer ce séminaire, permettez-moi, comme chaque semaine, de remercier l'équipe Ariel, sans laquelle ces événements live ne pourraient pas avoir lieu. I'd like to thank my Ariel co-organizers, that is to say Barbara Schmidt, whom you'll be hearing today, and Amy Pelletier. Nos sponsors aussi, qui nous ont permis d'accueillir Moali, l'Université de Lorraine, l'UFR Al Nancy, uh, l'IUT Nancy Charlemagne, notre laboratoire de recherche IDEA, et la métropole du Grand Nancy. Merci à tous les organisateurs de cette série d'épisodes, Monica, Marilyn, Nathalie, Claire et Estelle, ainsi qu'à nos formidables assistants de recherche qui, chaque semaine, sont aux manettes de la communication et de la promotion de ces séminaires sur les réseaux sociaux. Lisa, qui, a, euh, qui crée tous les, les très beaux flyers, d'ailleurs, que vous pouvez voir chaque semaine, mais aussi Pauline, Delphine, Élise, Erast et Victoire. Cette série de, de cinq, cinq épisodes a été organisée par IDEA pour nos collègues et nos étudiants de Master Monde Anglophone à Nancy, mais elle a aussi été pensée pour vous tous afin de vous faire connaître Mohale et son univers littéraire. The IR series has been organized by both our colleagues and students and it's been put together for them but it's also for all of you watching us tonight. And I hope that there are many of you watching us uh, on Teams uh, this evening, despite the burning current events and the other broadcasts competing with us tonight in France. D'ailleurs, je précise, nous attendons vos questions, uh, vos remarques, donc sur Teams, dans la partie commentaires. Um, N'hésitez pas, elles seront relayées, bien sûr, de les poser après chaque intervenant. Vous pouvez aussi voir et revoir les séminaires précédents sur la chaîne YouTube. Un dernier merci, et je finis par cela parce que sans eux, nous ne pourrions être avec vous ce soir. Merci donc à l'équipe de la direction numérique de l'Université de Lorraine, tout particulièrement à Luc et son aide technique précieuse, même si ce soir, malheureusement, nous n'avons pas pu être sur YouTube comme nous le voulions. C'est aussi le, le problème, donc, les problèmes techniques du live en direct. Um, donc merci de nous rejoindre sur Teams et je vois que vous êtes nombreux, c'est vraiment gentil. We're hosting quite a few speakers tonight, all involved in the translating and publishing industries, and we thank them for accepting our invitation and joining us live from France and South Africa. I'll give and now give the floor to Pauline uh, Charrier, étudiante en Master 1 uh, Monde Anglophone, qui voulait présenter à brièvement tour à tour. Pauline, it's up to you now. Alors, Georges Lory est un traducteur français spécialisé dans la littérature sud-africaine. Il est diplômé de l'Institut d'études politiques de Paris et a occupé de ministère de l'Intérieur, journaliste indépendant, conseiller culturel en Afrique du Sud ou encore délégué général des alliances françaises en Afrique australe de 2009 à 2013. Il a traduit de nombreuses œuvres sud-africaines en français, notamment depuis l'Africans, la poésie de Brayton Brayton Back et Anne Krog, et depuis l'anglais, des romans de Nadine Gordimer et John Cotty. Il dirige la série Lettres sud-africaines chez Actes Sud, dont il va nous parler aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup, Pauline. Maintenant, on va à George. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Euh, Actes Sud a pris la décision de créer une collection, une série Lettres sud-africaines en 2014, mais en regardant de près ma bibliothèque, je me suis aperçu que ça fait depuis une vingtaine d'années que cette maison d'édition s'intéresse à l'Afrique du Sud. 
je peux déjà montrer ce livre d'Adrian Van Dies qui raconte un voyage en Afrique du Sud dans les années 92. Je peux citer l'anthologie de la poésie sud-africaine euh, organisée par Dennis Hirson en 1998. Euh, je m'aperçois que Actes Sud a publié les euh, réflexions philosophiques de Brighton Brighton Back. Il y a quatre livres de philosophie et de, et de poèmes, mais essentiellement de philosophie. Je continue. En 2004, euh, Actes Sud a publié un livre majeur d'Anki Kroch, un, comme on dit, Anki Kroch, Krog, k r o g sur la commission Vérité et Réconciliation, sous le titre « La douleur des mots ». Elle l'a raconté de façon très personnelle, très émotionnelle, les travaux de cette commission animée par euh, Monseigneur Toutou. Et euh, là encore, Actes Sud était présent. Je vois qu'il y a eu aussi un recueil de Brighton, Brighton Back, euh, sur son amitié avec Mahmoud Darwish, qui a eu le prix Max Jacob. Et euh, une des, euh, un des piliers d'Actes Sud, euh, Charlotte Voilet, a publié le roman euh, « Mandela et moi » de Louis Nkosi. Tout ça pour dire qu'il y avait un, un terreau euh, impressionnant euh, sur l'Afrique du Sud chez Actes Sud et euh, il était au début question de glisser l'Afrique du Sud au sein de la collection Lettres néerlandaises animée par Philippe Noble. Et après un certain nombre de réunions, on s'est dit qu'il fallait faire une, une collection séparée parce que euh, l'Afrique du Sud euh, est, est plurilingue, que la littérature en langue anglaise est très importante et que euh, même l'Afrikaans, qui est un dérivé du néerlandais, un créole du néerlandais, euh, poursuit un chemin autonome. Et donc, il a été euh, finalement décidé en 2014 de lancer une série Lettres sud-africaines. Pourquoi une série et pas une collection la collection a un côté plus régulier, un certain nombre de publications par an, tandis que la série est parfaitement souple. Euh, à preuve, euh, depuis euh, qu'elle a été créée, euh, trois livres sont sortis et un quatrième va sortir tout début 2021. Je dois dire que c'est un grand plaisir de travailler avec Actes Sud parce que d'emblée, j'ai proposé trois titres qui ont tous trois été acceptés. Je les cite. « Coconut » de Copano Matlois, 2015, « Rivière fantôme » de Dominique Botta, 2016, « Le lamento » de Winnie Mandela, de Njabulun Debele, 2019, et le livre qui va sortir en mars prochain s'appelle « Fille à soldat »« Camp Hoor » dans le titre en Afrikaans, de François Smith. Et en dépit de son prénom qui est français et de son patronyme qui est anglais, François Smith est un écrivain de langue africaine. Ça fait partie de, de l'intérêt de, de l'Afrique du Sud, ce mélange des, différentes, des différents apports. Alors, pour euh, vous dire, quatre livres en sept ans, ce n'est pas beaucoup, mais ce sont quand même des, des écrivains qui comptent. Dans cette série « Lettres sud-africaines », on veut donner la parole aux écrivains qui ont quelque chose d'important à dire sur leur pays. On a évité des livres historiques, euh, on a évité la, la, les essais. Ce sont des romans de personnes jeunes, de, pour la plupart, et euh, qui, qui racontent l'Afrique du Sud d'aujourd'hui. Je suis très fier de trouver qu'il y a un bel équilibre. Il y a deux hommes, deux femmes, deux noirs, deux blancs, deux romans en africains, deux romans en anglais. Euh, pour bien faire, il faudrait euh, que le suivant euh, soit d'un écrivain métis. J'avais bien proposé euh, Valda Janssen, qui écrit en africains, qui a écrit une élégie un peu triste sur son passage en Allemagne de l'Est, mais ça n'a pas été retenu. Donc, je ne sais pas quelle sera la suite. Le fait est que euh, l'intérêt le, le, d'Acte Sud pour l'Afrique du Sud va continuer. Ça m'a été confirmé de façon tout à fait officielle. Donc, on, on, 
c'est un petit peu un, un message à faire passer que il y a euh, un, une possibilité d'éditer des romans sud-africains chez eux. Vous trouverez que quatre livres en sept ans, ce n'est pas beaucoup. Alors, c'est vrai qu'au début, ça a très bien commencé. Ensuite, vous vous souviendrez peut-être que la responsable d'Actes Sud a été nommée ministre de la Culture, donc c'était un peu euh, délicat. Il y avait tout un tas de, de prises de décisions qui ont été retardées. Ensuite, il y a eu engorgement de, de manuscrits chez Actes Sud, et c'est pourquoi le livre de Djaboulon de Bellé, la, le Lamento de Winnie Mandela, a pris tant de temps à sortir, puisqu'il n'est sorti que fin 2019, alors que la traduction remontait déjà à 2016. Heureusement pour euh, Actes Sud, pour moi, pour tous ceux qui s'intéressent à, à l'Afrique du Sud, la littérature en Afrique du Sud est riche, et euh, j'espère bien que ça continuera et un, plutôt un rythme soutenu, ça, ça, ça vaudrait mieux. Je voudrais juste dire un mot, s'il me reste un peu de temps, sur le, les problèmes de traduction d'écrivains sud-africains en français. La majeure partie des écrivains écrivent en anglais. Néanmoins, la littérature de langue africaine est extrêmement dynamique avec des, des écrivains majeurs, que on connaît André Brink, on connaît, on connaît Brighton Breitenbach, mais il y en a bien d'autres de, de jeunes talents. Et enfin, il y a de la littérature en langue bantou. Euh, à ma connaissance, il n'y a qu'un seul livre du Zulu qui a été traduit en français, de M. J. Mgadi, euh, « On est foutu ». C'est un livre assez triste d'ailleurs, le, le titre l'indique. Il y a une spécificité dans la, la traduction de, de, la, de la littérature sud-africaine, c'est qu'il faut énormément de dictionnaires. Bien sûr, quand on traduit de l'Afrikaans, euh, déjà au départ, il n'y a pas de euh, dictionnaire français africans Donc, il faut passer par le dictionnaire anglais, anglais africans Et puis, pour vérifier quand il y a un doute, je jette souvent un coup d'œil sur un gros dictionnaire français néerlandais, parce que l'Afrikaans et le néerlandais ont parfois des racines, des racines communes. Et puis enfin, le, la littérature sud-africaine s'est développée de façon propre avec un mélange de beaucoup de langues. Ça implique d'avoir un dictionnaire Zulu, un dictionnaire Setswana, un dictionnaire Kosa. Euh, désolé pour Mohale, je n'ai pas de dictionnaire français Sesoto, ou même anglais Sesoto, je crois que français ça n'existe pas, même si le Sesoto a été alphabétisé par des missionnaires français dans les années 1830. Euh, L'Afrique du Sud développe aussi un, un vocabulaire qui est propre, et j'ai un euh, livre absolument essentiel qui est le, le dictionnaire de l'anglais sud-africain, parce qu'il y a des euh, expressions de toutes les langues du pays qui se mélangent et qui rentrent toutes dans le langage commun. Je profite de cette diapositive pour, parce qu'elle n'est pas forcément très claire. Et il s'agit de Lebo Machile, qui est une poète euh, dont j'ai traduit euh, plusieurs poèmes pour euh, Chantier Naval. Et je trouvais que la couverture pour les poèmes de Lebo et pour de Yearning avait une similitude tout à fait intéressante. Est-ce que je passe la parole à quelqu'un d'autre ou je réponds à des questions Oui, merci. Merci beaucoup, Georges, pour votre, votre intervention. Euh, tout à fait, on peut prendre des questions. Donc, s'il y a des questions qui, sont, qui, qui viennent, hein, donc là, les personnes peuvent les poser directement si elles veulent en allumant leur micro ou en les posant par le... Euh, par le chat et puis je peux les relayer également. Euh, moi, sinon, j'ai déjà une question à vous poser, mais on va voir s'il y a déjà, je regarde s'il y a une question. Euh, pas pour l'instant. Euh, donc, peut-être une première question, ce serait, euh, quel serait le, le prochain auteur euh, sud-africain que vous aimeriez voir publié euh, chez Actes Sud Est-ce que vous avez déjà, vous travaillez euh, sur un auteur ou vous avez un auteur en tête que vous voudriez faire connaître euh, chez Actes Sud oui, il y a beaucoup d'auteurs euh, sud-africains que j'aime bien. J'aime bien Mandla Langa, euh, j'aimais beaucoup euh, le défunt Ahmad Dangor. Euh, oui, il y a, il y a beaucoup, beaucoup de jeunes écrivains. Mais comme je vous ai dit, le, la dernière proposition que j'ai faite à Actes Sud a été rejetée. Euh, 
euh, il s'agissait de, de Valda Janssen. Donc, non, je n'ai personne en vue, mais je crois savoir que vous travaillez euh, collectivement à la traduction de, de Yearning et euh, ce serait intéressant de, de voir ce que ça donne et de le proposer avec le Sud. Mmh, ben on aimerait bien. <rire> on pourra en discuter donc, après là, lors d'intervention oui. pour Barbara Schmitt et des étudiantes. Il euh, y a une question en fait, euh, de Céline Mandaglio qui vous demande le nom du dictionnaire que vous utilisez. Je pense que c'était celui euh, anglais africain que vous utilisez. Oui, j'ai un gros dictionnaire anglais africain. De... Ils sont trois à l'avoir fait. C est, c est, c est, euh... Vous voulez que j'aille le chercher Il est juste derrière moi. Si vous voulez, oui. Je crois que Céline demandait en fait le, le dictionnaire qui a été montré à l'écran tout à l'heure. Ah, le petit dictionnaire, ah, pardon, oui. D'accord. Alors, je le remontre. Uh, a dictionary of South African English. Est-ce que c'est clair ouais. Ça se voit, il faut... Oui, là c'est bien, ouais. bougez Ça plus. Voilà. Bien oui, voilà. oui, tout à fait. Parce que le, le gros dictionnaire africain, il est, il est très bateau, il est très... très euh... Oui, et il est un peu vécu. D'accord, super. On a aussi une question en fait, de, de Cédric Courtois qui nous a rejoint. Euh, on le salue. Euh, il se demandait en fait, si les traductions des ouvrages mentionnés ont eu beaucoup de succès en France. Alors, beaucoup, je ne sais pas que dire. Euh, à partir de quand on considère que c'est un succès Apparemment, mmh. c'est suffisamment bon pour qu'Acte Sud continue à mon avis, ça n'a pas excédé 1000 exemplaires chacun, euh, les, les trois auteurs. Je ne me suis pas étendu sur les trois auteurs, mais Coconut, je voulais souligner une chose. En Afrique du Sud, un tirage de 2000 est considéré comme un bon succès. Quand on passe à 3000, c'est un best-seller. Il faut savoir que Coconut a tiré à 21 000 exemplaires. Donc, C'est un, un succès phénoménal selon les critères sud-africains. Coconut de Copano Matlois. Ouais. Euh, donc, c'est pour ça que je trouvais ça intéressant. Ce sont les interrogations de deux jeunes filles nées après l'apartheid et qui évoluent dans cette société sud-africaine où le mot apartheid n'intervient d'ailleurs jamais, mais où les tensions ou les incompréhensions demeurent importantes. Mm -hmm. Le second livre, euh, euh, Rivière fantôme, raconte euh, la, la, la vie d'une famille euh, africaneur euh, du côté de, 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 de Bloemfontein, enfin un, un peu au nord de Bloemfontein, euh, c'est dans, dans une ville agricole, et euh, le suicide du frère aîné que l'on voit en un petit garçon euh, sur, sur la couverture, euh, et qui raconte les années... 80, 90 en Afrique du Sud, le, le changement, les premières élections démocratiques. Le troisième, le Lamento de Winnie Mandela, est une œuvre très importante de Njabulu Ndebele, qui lui est un, un universitaire reconnu, euh, qui a fait peu de romans, il écrit peu, mais quand c'est toujours très profond, il est, il, est, il est philosophe dans son sens, et euh, effectivement, le Lamento de Winnie Mandela est une œuvre romanesque autant que philosophique et en tant qu'écrivain noir, il peut s'autoriser à demander très clairement à Winnie Mandela si elle n'a pas fait de grosses erreurs euh, quand elle est revenue à Soweto euh, dans les années 90, 80 90 Donc euh, ces, trois, ces trois auteurs me paraissaient tous très importants et représentatifs d'une certaine Afrique du Sud d'aujourd'hui. Mmh. D'accord. Merci beaucoup, Georges. Euh, donc, s'il n'y a pas d'autres questions, peut-être qu'on peut vous reprendre euh, après, euh, lorsqu'Andrea ce sera, ce sera fait sa petite présentation, puis ça serait intéressant d'avoir un échange entre vous deux, je pense. Oui. Euh, donc, Pauline, si vous voulez bien intervenir pour présenter, merci beaucoup, hein, Georges, merci pour votre oui. intervention, puis on vous retrouve tout à l'heure. Euh, Pauline, si vous voulez bien intervenir euh, et présenter Andrea, merci beaucoup. Andrea Natras is a publisher at Pan Macmillan South Africa since February 2010. Um, she and her team are responsible for publishing Pan Macmillan South African authors, producing around 20 books each year. Their focus is on celebrating African excellence and on sharing these fiction and non-fiction titles with readers in South Africa and around the world. 
A contribution of today is entitled Literary Prizes in South Africa, celebrating the writing of Moali Mashiro. Thanks very much. It's wonderful to be here. Um, that introduction pretty much sums up my role. I work in a very small team. There are only three of us, and we produce between 20 and 25 titles a year. Interestingly, the South African market is very focused towards nonfiction. Um, so in a year when I'm publishing 20 books, 15 of those will be nonfiction titles and five of them will be um, fiction titles. If you just go to the next slide, Celine, then you can just see an assortment of the books that we publish in any given year. It was interesting to hear some of those names, like a professor in Jabula and Debele. He's one of our authors. We've published recently an edition of The Cry of Winnie Mandela as well. Um, so you can see a real mix of fiction, non-fiction, uh, current affairs, politics. Um, but one of the things which we really love doing is we love finding new voices and Many of you might be aware of the Mahali Mashigo story, but Mahali is an author that Pan Macmillan South Africa is very proud to publish. Um, she's currently working uh, on a new novel for us um, that we hope to publish in the course of 2021. So that's very exciting. But the books that she's published to date with us, if we can go to the next slide. The books published to date are The Yearning, Beyond the River and a short story collection, Intruders. And I just thought it would be interesting for you to get a sense of the sales that we see in South Africa. We typically sell 2,000 copies of a fiction title and 1,500 copies of a short story collection. These are lifetime sales that are, uh, we've got here um, and they're composed of a trade paperback edition, a paperback edition, ebook sales, and then something like Lightning Source, so print on demand. But you can see that The Yearning has been a runaway bestseller in our part of the world, selling over 7,000 copies. I had to include just the one that was uh, 7,001 were the sales figures that I saw this year. Um, Beyond the River was an adaptation of a script um, for much smaller market. Uh, it's a school educational book. And then Intruders, a wonderful short story collection which you've been working with and which students are translating, and it's going to be very exciting to see that with its gorgeous co cover, is uh, something which has sold 2,634 copies. I also thought it would be interesting for you to see the rights that we've sold internationally to date um, in terms of Mahali's books. The next slide, please, Celine. So it's been interesting to see the territories in which we've had interest in Mahali's writing. We've sold Portuguese translation rights, world rights for intruders. We've sold Arabic translation rights, again, world for the yearning. And then recently we've uh, sold America's North and South America and world Arabic rights for intruders. So one of the things which has been fascinating for us to see is in the last year or two, there's definitely been a, more of an interest in South African um, authors. Uh, their work has got relevance um, and has been of interest uh, to readers around the world. Just to quickly give you a rundown of our the literary prizes that we have in South Africa. It's a very small community of readers, of writers, of booksellers, and of publishers, in fact. So essentially, there are eight major awards that are generally awarded in any particular year. Um, COVID-19 has placed um, some difficulties in the organizing of some of these awards. So for example, this year, we, we didn't have the Sunday Times Awards for nonfiction or for fiction. The South African Literary Awards are awarded in various categories, um, and those awards have been around for, it was founded in 2005, um, and is partly uh, associated with our National Department of Arts and Culture, and it draws on South Africa's rich cultural um, heritage and literary landscape, and various categories are available for entry. Then the University of Johannesburg Literary Awards, um, also known as the UJ Prize, is an interesting one because it's not linked to any specific genre. Um, they have a debut prize for a writer who is publishing their first book, 
and then they have a main prize for a novelist or a nonfiction author. Um, the, the, the judges have quite a tough time, I think, because they get entries in various genres and fiction and nonfiction, and from those, they narrow down those entries um, into a debut winner and a main prize winner. And then the National Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences Awards um, are also awarded in various categories. Um, in nonfiction, for example, they look at a monograph, an edited volume, and a biography. And then in fiction, they look at a best fiction single authored volume, and then they look at something that is an edited volume, so maybe a collection of short stories. And then the Felida Literary Award is a relatively recent award. Its inaugural um, uh, awarding or prize giving was, was this year, earlier this year. And um, it is awarded to someone, a writer, who is kind of mid-career with three to five books of any genre. Um, it's an award that was established by Karina Brink, who is the, in memory of her late husband, um, the renowned author Andre Brink, and it recognizes a, a, an author with a consistent record of publishing works of excellence. And it aims to encourage them further in their pursuit of a literary career. And then the NOMA Awards are specifically um, presented by the African Speculative Fiction Society. And they recognize works of speculative fiction by Africans, African writers, science fiction, fantasies, stories of magic and traditional belief. It, alternative histories, horror, and then their catch-all strange stuff, which is a wonderful category to have. And then an interesting one, the Nine Mobile Award, it was known as the Etisalat Award. That is a prize that was, uh, and I say was because um, it, it hasn't been awarded in the last few years because the Etisalat company changed names to Nine Mobile, and at the same time, they appeared to have gotten into financial difficulty. But at the time when it was being awarded, that was the, the richest literary prize that was available in Africa. There are a few international prizes that South African um, authors are eligible for, if you go to the next slide. That's, there's the International Dublin Literary Award. That is an award where um, librarians around the world uh, nominate their favorite titles for a particular year. And then a long list is drawn up, and from that, a short list. So it's it's a book that, I mean, it's an award that South African librarians can nominate um, their favorite authors for. And then the International Booker Prize. But what is interesting is it's not enough simply for a book to be available um, internationally, to be eligible for the International Booker Prize. Rather, it has to be specifically published by an international publisher. So it's not simply about availability. And then just to celebrate a little bit Mahali's own achievements, the prizes that she has won um, in the South African context. The Yearning, which was published in 2016, was the winner of the University of Johannesburg Prize, debut prize um, in 2016. It was also long listed for the International Dublin Literary Award, and it was shortlisted for the South African Literary Awards first time published Author Award. So it's a novel that has received much critical recognition um, in the form of the shortlistings and the winning of the UJ Award, as well as doing um, remarkably well in terms of um, sales in our market. In addition, Ghost Strain N, which is one of the um, short stories that is in Intruders, was long listed for a 2019 Nomo Short Story Award. And then finally, um, I was talking about it a little earlier, Mahali was the inaugural winner of the Felida Literary Award in February 2020. And it was before lockdown, before COVID really hit, and we were able to have a wonderful ceremony honoring Mahali and the work that she's done and to continue encouraging her in terms of the right, the work and the writing that she continues to do. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Sandra, for this um, brilliant presentation, which tells us a bit more about uh, prizes um, and the representation of South African literature on the international scene. Um, so I think I know uh, George has some questions for you, uh, otherwise I've got some as well. 
Uh, and I'm sure that um, some of our viewers will have questions as well. Um, George, I don't know if you want to start asking your questions or I mean, you can um, you can well, ask them. I think I, I wanted to make sure with you, Andrea, the Sunday Times Literary Award have, has a, a jury of judges which changes every year. Is that correct? Um, it's a jury of judges that generally changes every year, although one or two of the judges might remain the same. Sometimes the person who is chairing the fiction or chairing the nonfiction will remain for a year or two and then work with different judges. That's mm -hmm. something I appreciate because in all literary jury, uh, the judges are uh, elected uh, for life, which is a bit uh, worrying sometimes. Yeah, I think it's important to have fresh, fresh eyes and fresh voices and um, allowing people to appreciate different genres and, you know, different talents. I saw that um, there was a special literary prize for Khoisan languages a few years ago. It's something which is not going to repeat. No, I, 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 I know the award that you're thinking of, and I think that it was a once-off award honoring um five the, yeah those languages yes okay. unfortunately there's no you know there's no publication particularly mm -hmm. because obviously it's a language that is um sadly very much close to extinction yes mm -hmm. um i don't know if you we've got a couple of questions from our viewers as well so yeah I see that. Add some more um, would, yeah. would I consider Pan Macmillan as a window of giving visibility Af to African authors abroad? I mean, I'm biased because I'm the publisher and obviously we do what we can in terms of promoting uh, visibility. I don't know if Mohali maybe wants to jump in here. Um, mm -hmm. She, her books have seen great sales via the ebook platform and via the lightning source print on demand platform. So I would feel that her books are getting visibility. Yeah, it's it's very difficult for South African authors to kind of get their books, you know, in, into other regions. Um, you have to have an agent, you have to be like super well known or whatever. And I think, in my opinion, uh, my publishers have done everything in their power to get um, my books in, in the hands of readers abroad. And I know it's not all publishers that do, do that. And I'm not just saying that because I love my publishers. <laughs> but I do think that at Pan Macmillan, they, they really do try to get the books abroad. So they are the ones who push you to actually publish or to, to uh, take part in a competition, literary competition, or this sort of thing. So is that you who sort of um, try, who try on your own? I really don't get involved in being nominated for uh, literary prizes because I'm sure Andrea will tell you that it's the publishers that usually put books forward. Right. Yeah, the publishers are the ones that nominate prizes um, or nominate authors and works for prizes. Mm -hmm. um, what we do is we have to obviously keep our ear very close to the ground because sometimes international awards open up for one reason or another, perhaps to the Africa region. So through the um, Publishers Association of South Africa, uh, all the publishers are kind of kept abreast of what are the awards internationally that um, our books are potentially eligible for and, you know, what are the criteria and how do you go about entering them? And um, someone else asked, what is the percentage of South African books translated into foreign languages in Europe and the rest of the world? And, um, you know, sadly, that percentage, I would say, is very small, maybe between five and 10 percent of all the titles that we publish. We've got a wonderful and thriving local publishing industry, but it's a, an intriguing thing where we are often told that our books are too South African to translate well. Um, and, you know, at the same time, we uh, find that a book um, such as Shuggy Bain, for example, that's just won the Booker Prize, um, does incredibly well in South Africa. So I don't always buy that argument that South African books wouldn't translate well. Um, into an international audience, but it is um, a fairly isolated market, and so there's there's difficulty. Um, you know, you need to work with literary agents, 
um, and you need to have access to the book fairs where rights are being bought and sold. And that's not always possible when you on the southern tip of Africa. I mean, ironically, the COVID-19 and the lockdown has opened up a lot of that to virtual book fairs. And we've been able to have meetings with people that we haven't necessarily had meetings with. Um, just as an interesting point, one of the markets that is very uh, relatively strong for South African um, and African publications is China. Um, I work with ANA Beijing and they do a great job in terms of finding um, authors, uh, uh, finding publishers who are interested in the books published by, and that's fiction and nonfiction, by South African authors. Um, and then the last question that I can see here, do South African publishers encourage writers to compete? Well, we've kind of addressed that um, as in it's the publishers that are the ones that put the books forward. And the, the reality, unfortunately, is that very few of those prizes are actually eligible if somebody doesn't have a publisher who is based in the UK or is based in the US. So it's tricky. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Sandra. Um, I think we've got uh, one last question. Um, so uh, from Anna Salome uh, Panaid, one of our students, would receiving an international award impact the sales in South Africa differently um, than receiving a South African award does? That's a good question. Unfortunately, the answer is yes. Um, the Ahmad Dango Bitter Fruit was shortlisted for the Booker Prize uh, many years ago. And the impact of being shortlisted for an international award comes with, you know, international publicity, um, particularly via social media channels. Um, and a, a lot of the bookstores pay attention to that kind of publicity. Um, and, you know, if you pile a book up high, it tends to attract a reader's attention. Um, certain of the South African awards, the Sunday Times Literary Awards for Fiction and Nonfiction and the University of Johannesburg Awards in particular, do have um, an impact on sales. But for the most part, what is really valuable about the prizes in South Africa is that there tends to be a small amount of prize money which is given to an author. And that allows that person to pursue their writing um, and to make time for their writing because it's very hard, ask Mahali, she will tell you, to be a full-time author. Um, I mean, I haven't even touched on the other amazing publishing that she does uh, with Crazy and, and also Black Panther. Um, but to be a full-time writer in South Africa, you have to have your fingers in many, many pies and you have to work incredibly hard and be meeting lots of deadlines. Yeah, Andrea, that is correct. I mean, ideally, we'd all like to, you know, have a writing career in South Africa where we can just be like, hey, I'm an author and that's all I do. But because our, our reading market is so tiny, we do end up um, doing a lot of things. So I am a full time writer, but I'm not a full time, like, you know, fiction author. So I I am currently writing for TV and film. I write comics i've started writing for games so you know one day maybe i'll be able to say hey i'm just a full-time fiction writer we look forward to that day <laughs> okay thank you thank you very much um so in the meantime perhaps we could see how it could be translated into french um uh, and and see whether it could also cross borders and be um, so that Mohali is recognized in France as well, which I think she we all think she deserves. Um, so thank you very much to both um, both of you and to George. And maybe you can come um, live with us a bit later after Barbara and the two students have um, spoken about their their work on the translation of um, of Mohali's The Yearning. So Pauline, if you'd like to introduce um, our next speakers, thank you very much to. Barbara Schmidt est maître de conférence en anglais à l'Université de Lorraine et co-organisatrice de la résidence Ariel. Elle a déjà traduit plusieurs romans pour les éditions Inculte, Actes Sud et Le Cherche Midi. Elle coordonne l'équipe de traduction collaborative de The Yearning de Moalema Shibo, composée d'étudiants et d'enseignants de l'UFR Art Lettres Langues Nancy, du Lansad et de l'IUT Nancy Charlemagne, ainsi que d'élèves et professeurs des classes préparatoires des lycées Raymond Poincaré de Nancy et Georges de la Tour de Metz. Les deux étudiantes sont Noémie Didier, 
Master 2, Langue et Société, Bilangue, Biculture, Traduction, Traductologie, Anglais et Allemand à l'Université de Lorraine, qui s'intéresse plus particulièrement à la traduction littéraire et aux écrivaines, et qui a rejoint le projet Ariel pour euh, le projet de traduction collective ainsi que pour euh, la communication. Elle participe notamment à la rédaction d'articles pour le blog Ariel ainsi que la newsletter. Et Anna Abdel Salam, qui est en master de traduction et traductologie anglais-arabe à l'Université de Lorraine. Elle s'intéresse à l'interprétation, la traduction technique, mais aussi la rédaction de contenu web. Elle est aussi traductrice indépendante et a traduit des publications du CNRS vers l'arabe, comme l'Atlas de l'Égypte contemporaine. Merci Pauline. Alors, c'est bon. Alors, je vais partager mon écran, ça prendra juste une toute petite... Euh... Alors, vous avez... Voilà. Um, so, uh, I'm going to, to, to speak about the challenges of translating South African culture in uh, Mohale's The Yearning, and this talk is meant to be a kind of... A, a conversation as well uh, with uh, the public, of course, and uh, with two students, two students, uh, Noemi and Anna, who are just two of the many students who participate in the project. So I have intended this talk as a kind of uh, a reflection, in a way, of the type of work that we're doing, that we are currently doing on uh, the translation of the yearning. Well, first, a few words. Uh, about the, the context, but uh, Andrea and George have already touched on these topics, so I will be very, uh, uh, very quick on this point. But I just wanted to, to stress the fact that uh, the, the linguistic situation in South Africa with uh, uh, 11 official languages um, uh, explains uh, the, the, the kind of... Um, hybrid dimension that we can find in South African uh, texts and uh, particularly in Mohale's text. And uh, only, well, according to a census, a 2011 census, only 11% of South Africans have English as their first language, uh, which means that most of the novels of the South African texts written in English are already a transposition of uh, the South African Uh, worldview of the South African universe of discourse, uh, to quote Le Fever, uh, into another universe of discourse or into another worldview, uh, which means that, and this is part of our challenge, uh, that if we want to translate uh, a South African text written in English into French or into any other language, uh, it means a kind of double uh, transposition process as Paul Bondia uh, explains uh, more particularly. And uh, we are faced with hybrid texts. And uh, of course, the, 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 this uh, hybrid na nature is part of the difficulty of the translation. But uh, what I would like to, 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 to show here, what I will try to show, is that I, I really think Uh, that translating a South African novel into French is possible, to answer uh, Andrea's uh, question, uh, or at least uh, the remarks that uh, she has heard uh, quite often on the subject. Um, the first thing I think, I guess, that uh, we have to keep in mind when we translate uh, such a text is that um, uh, the English is chosen, of course, not necessarily because it is the first language of the author. Mohale's first language is not English, as she says. Well, her English is beautiful. We would all like uh, speaking like her, but uh, it's not her first language. It's not a mother language. Um, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, most um, uh, African, South African writers write in English or Africans, I guess. I don't know about the proportions, and this is not my point here. And uh, for a very long time, there has been this opposition, in a way, that was introduced by the colonizers uh, between uh, the tradition of oral literature in African languages and written literature uh, in English. Uh, well, things may be changing a lot, may be changing a bit with 
some texts uh, published in African languages, but I guess that the proportion is still a, a very tiny proportion. So what I think we have to keep in mind when translating a book written in English, but a South African book written in English, is that uh, English um, is the language of the colonizer. Uh, well, I have read that it was sometimes uh, preferred to Africans, which uh, represents apartheid and which is the symbol of apartheid, so that English was used to, to, to fight against Africans. But English is also a means to impose a, an alien worldview on Africans, or at least has been a means to impose an alien worldview on Africans, and has been instrumental in uh, essentializing Africans, uh, as, uh, and I'm quoting here the beautiful poem by Koleka Putuma, uh, when she says that, uh, uh, well, colonization and English, the language in particular, uh, has reduced Africans to a mass of blackness. So we should be aware of uh, this uh, of this choice of writing in English, which is not an obvious choice for a South African writer. And I've just quoted uh, two authors who disagreed uh, on the topic. On the one hand, Ngugi Wa Tiongo, uh, who thought that uh, uh, killing a language was like uh, killing a, a memory bank, a people's memory bank, and who wrote himself uh, in his own African language and then self-translated uh, his, um, his novels so as to be read by a wider public. And on the other hand, Chinua, uh, Chinua Achebe, uh, who uh, admitted that uh, writing in English was like a, a dreadful betrayal and produced a guilty feeling, but to him there was no choice because if he wanted to be read by a wider audience, then English would be the language to choose. I've insisted on this because uh, in Mohale's text, of course the text is in English, but obviously uh, the, the subtext uh, the ethnotext, uh, to quote Chantal Zabu, uh, is a typically South African. And it is especially this subtext that we'll have to translate. And probably uh, the, the most important part of the translation will be uh, to translate this subtext. I mean that linguistically speaking, of course, we do have issues to address. But it is especially the translation of the South African culture, how to express the South African culture in French, uh, French with another worldview, French with another uh, universe of discourse. And this is what we are trying to do uh, with our team. So just a few words about uh, the Ariel team. It's uh, made up of many students, well, I would say about 50 of them, uh, divided into groups and each group uh, is going to work or is working at the moment uh, on a part of the translation with uh, a teacher or a lecturer as uh, a kind of supervisor. Um, and uh, we are currently uh, in the first stage of the translation, which is to, to read the text, understand the text and try to to translate, but it's just the first stage of the translation, to translate what we have understood from the text. And uh, the difficulties that we are faced with, as I've said, are first maybe uh, all the expressions, all the words in, uh, in, uh, in African languages. Uh, there are words in uh, Sesotho or Sepedi, uh, I think it's the same, uh, in Easy Zulu, uh, in Afrikaans sometimes. And of course, we need to understand what is said, and the presence of Mohali with us is uh, a great uh, is a great thing because uh, it means that we can uh, ask questions. What do you mean, Mohali? Uh, is it Sepedi? Is it Zizulu? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So it's uh, it's a great opportunity for us for the whole team. We have already organized uh, a meeting uh, to ask uh, the different questions that uh, we had so far. Um, what makes things quite easy from this point of view is that even if there is, a, 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 well, switching from one language to another throughout the book, which is 
simply a reflection of South African reality. And Mohale insisted that she wanted to give this reality that sometimes in South Africa, uh, people do not uh, necessarily understand everything that is said because uh, of people switching from one African language to another African language. So this reality we want to express in the French version, and we have decided, of course, to, to keep uh, the African languages, the African sentences, the African, uh, the African, um, um, yes, the African sentences as they are. And uh, this is facilitated for us by uh, the, the use that Mohali uh, makes of, uh, of the technique of cushioning, uh, to quote Chantal Zabu again. Uh, uh, I have uh, included two examples here, uh, two examples of how Mohali uh, allows the reader, any reader, including uh, the English reader here, or the, uh, the English speaking reader, to understand uh, the expressions in African languages, because uh, in one way or another, uh, she's going to, to explain uh, in a very uh, subtle way sometimes, but she's going to explain the context and we can all uh, more or less understand what is uh, being said even uh, when the, uh, the characters speak uh, African languages. What also facilitates our task is that Marubini, uh, the narrator, and I have included three quotations uh, which are typical of what she's being told throughout the text, Marubini herself feels as an outsider sometimes uh, because she does not uh, fully understand Sepedi, for instance, or she does not fully master Sepedi, uh, rather. And uh, she, she's called a township uh, child. Uh, her Sepedi is said to be diluted. And her point of view, in a way, is a kind of, well, she acts as a kind of go-between, uh, between, uh, between uh, the, the European reader here, uh, in our case, and, uh, and the text itself, uh, which facilitates our task in a way, because we are introduced not only to African languages, but also to uh, the African uh, culture, uh, through the eyes, sometimes of a little girl, because there are uh, many passages in which we have the point of view of Marubini as a, a little girl, and um, her perception of, uh, of the little township girl is a facilitating factor for the translation, because not only for the African languages, but also, uh, for instance, when she speaks about uh, healing, uh, she sees this from the outside. She seems to be discovering the world, uh, the world that she's being shown, and uh, it is easier for us to approach it in a way. So thank you, Mohali, for this. Um, concerning the translation itself, uh, we agreed from the start that we didn't want the translation to be what uh, Apia calls a thick translation, that is an academic translation, which would use uh, footnotes and endnotes to explain absolutely everything about South African culture. This is not, of course, what is expected uh, of a, such a translation. Um, besides, and I uh, completely agree with this, uh, uh, and I'm reading, I'm quoting from Ashcroft in The Empire Writes Back, uh, when he says, a glossing gives the translated word and thus the receptor culture the higher status. And um, I would quote um, an article that I read in which the translator spoke about an encounter uh, with an African writer, and he, he asked the African writer, I can't remember exactly uh, which country he came from, but he asked the, the English-speaking African writer uh, if he wanted him uh, to, 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 to include footnotes uh, to explain some of the words. And the African writer got angry and said, well, uh, when I read, for instance, Voltaire or any other author, uh, you have no footnotes to explain uh, what Voltaire me meant. So, no, I don't want footnotes uh, to my novel. And I, I quite agree with this. Um, so, uh, the second stage of our translation, once we have 
analyze the text, read the text, analyze the text, uh, given a first translation of the text will be to rewrite the text. And uh, the rewriting of the text, that is once uh, I'm going to receive the different parts of the translation. Uh, the second stage, which is as important as the first one, is going to be to, to try to unify uh, the different uh, voices, the different, uh, the different parts of the translation that we have received. And the rewriting uh, will be a collective rewriting as well. Uh, a collective rewriting, uh, which we intend, uh, I particularly like this, uh, this uh, idea introduced by Gayatri uh, Spivak, uh, who says that uh, to, to, to avoid translationese, uh, that is, uh, uh, and I have given the definition here, that is to, to avoid a translation that would erase the identity uh, of the source culture, of the source text and uh, to present it as peripheral, uh, we have to approach the text through love and affinity. And I deeply uh, believe in this. Um, I've quoted uh, um, uh, Reflexion sur la littérature africaine et sa traduction by two Nigerian authors, but specialists of French, and this is why this is written in French, um, in which they, they explain that uh, if you if you want to translate uh, a South African text, you have to understand the, the cultural dynamics of uh, the, South African, uh, the South African culture. So uh, they, they insist on uh, the cultural uh, element, uh, the crucial cultural element uh, that has to be uh, developed if you want your uh, translation to be successful. And I think that with uh, the whole team, we are particularly aware of this. Um, I would like to, to add that um, we are working with students from modern languages, mostly, not only, but mostly, and uh, these students from modern languages, given the curriculum uh, that, they, that they have attended, uh, they have obviously great intercultural awareness, uh, a, a certain familiarity with post-colonial literature, uh, because uh, some of our classes, some of our courses are focused on these questions. Uh, they are particularly aware of the impact of British colonization on Africa, especially. Uh, they have this ability to research cultural references. So I think uh, these are uh, great, uh, great assets in a way. And the fact that we have so many people, it's true that Generally, a translation is a, a very solitary a job. Uh, a translator works on his own. But we, we still believe in a collaborative translation. And uh, we already translated one text in this way. And I, I think it was quite successful. Uh, it was Mark Safranco's Suicide that was published with uh, Uncult. And uh, the, the, the main... Uh, the, the main asset, I would say, of such, um, of, of such collaborative translation is that uh, we have as many viewpoints as we have students and teachers or lecturers participating in, uh, in the translation, people with unique identities, people with different backgrounds, uh, people who will have different approaches to the text. And uh, I think it's uh, always very amazing how students sometimes, uh, well, maybe they will not be able to translate a uh, whole text uh, in the right way, but very often uh, they, find the, uh, uh, they find the point which is not right, or they find the, uh, or they find the uh, well, maybe be the passage that you could not translate well, and they find the solution just because they come from different backgrounds, with from a different generation, from a different age group, from a different, uh, uh, well, yes, different backgrounds generally, what makes our identity and what makes of our identity something unique. And the fact that we have all these points of view, all these uh, voices in a way, um, is I think something very, uh, very crucial, uh, especially to approach uh, the subtext, the cultural subtext 
of uh, Mohale's The Yearning. Well, uh, now the challenge, of course, through the final rewriting will be to unify the different voices into one recognizable voice, which will express uh, the South African voice that Mohale's is conveying uh, through her text. And I, I would just conclude by saying that uh, I've reread uh, The Yearning, and the more I read it, the more I love it, Mohale. I think it's, uh, it's really a beautiful text. And I guess that if our translation is successful, uh, it has to be able to translate, or rather to express, maybe, uh, all the silences of your text. Georges was speaking earlier about all that was not said in one of the books, the fact that apartheid, for instance, was never mentioned. Uh, apartheid is mentioned maybe once directly in Mohali's book, but it's present in the background. It's everywhere. Uh, and it's everywhere, especially in the silences of the text. And uh, I guess that uh, a successful translation will be a translation which will be able to, to convey the silences of your text. Well, I'll read um, um, a first excerpt that we have translated, but later I would like uh, first to, uh, to ask uh, Noemi first, I guess, uh, to comment on a few passages on the on the difficulties uh, that uh, the different groups uh, could be faced with when they translated the text. Noemi? Yes, thank you. So um, when we first met for the translation, we discussed a few main points that we would follow through the old translation. And one of them was about the sentences and words that aren't in English in the text. And I think we all agreed right away to keep them as they were, because if it was written that way in uh, the text, we should keep it that way in the translation. So here you have an example of a discussion between Marubini, the um, narrator, and Makosha, her mother. And as you can see, Makosha uh, switched from one language to another, and the characters always do this in the whole novel. And so you might not understand what Makosha, uh, Makosha says, but uh, you have uh, an insight thanks to Marubini's thoughts just after it. So as you can see, Makosha speaks, and then Marubini's tells herself what her mother just told her. So you don't understand what is written, but you do understand what is written, thanks to Marubini. Uh, so as you can see in the translation, we kept the words as they were. We just uh, put them in italics. And then the translation explains. So, c'est menace de m'abandonner et de me laisser sans famille pour s'occuper de moi était toujours suivie de ses plaintes d'avoir mis au monde une enfant si égoïste alors qu'elle était une femme si pleine de bonté, et comme toujours, sans exception, le rappel cinglant que mon père n'était pas là. So you have an idea of Makosha and what she says to her daughter. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we also talked about, about cultural references. Um, we wanted to keep them as much as possible because the novel takes place in South Africa and we didn't want it to take place in France with the translation. So here uh, we are more on the spiritual side with uh, Ahmad Lozi and Uku Twasa. You don't necessarily know what it is and we don't have any French equivalents for these words but they're explained by Gogo, which is uh, Marubidi's grandmother. Uh, Ma um, in this excerpt, Marubidi is a child and she doesn't understand what uh, Amadlozi and Ukutwaza is. So her grandmother explains it to her and she explains it to us as well. Uh, we are on the same level as Marubini and we understand what is said with uh, what the grandmother said. So um, 
les amatlosi sont les défunts qui veillent sur nous. Ils détiennent des secrets très importants et en savent plus que nous parce qu'ils sont dans un endroit différent du nôtre. Euh, Gogo secoua la tête. Elle répondit que Baba était en train de suivre quelque chose qu'on appelle Ukutwaza. C'était une sorte d'école pour des gens spéciaux capables de communiquer avec les Amadlosi et de suivre leur enseignement. So we were able to keep Ukutwaza and Amadlosi as it is, uh, just in italics, uh, and people would understand in the translation what those words mean. Uh, but we sometimes had uh, different problems with cultural references and that is especially with school because school is very um, particular to one country and so here we have matric and grade 10 so matric is the exam at the end of high school in south africa and grade 10 is the first class in high school but we couldn't keep it as it was because a French reader wouldn't understand what grade 10 or matric is. Uh, especially for grade 10, it was a problem because in France we count the other way around. So grade 10 would be la seconde. But we couldn't just use the French equivalents, uh, which are baccalauréat and seconde, because it would set the novel in France and that's not what we wanted. The novel is South African, it's in South Africa, and we wanted to keep it in South Africa. So we're still discussing this issue. Uh, some people uh, wanted to use the translation you can see. So, tu m'aides pour mes examens de fin de cycle, tu devrais être fier de toi. Et toi, tu m'aides pour le programme de première année de lycée. So we don't use the French equivalent and we explain sort of what metric and grade 10 were, are. Some people would also want to keep metric uh, to keep a, a South African um, insight, <laughs> um, but uh, use another sentence to grade, for grade 10. So for example, tu devrais être fier de ton souvenir, ça fait déjà deux ans pour toi. We would understand that she mocks her boyfriend and we don't have to use an equivalent for grade 10 or second or whatever. <laughs> so here you can see that it's sometimes really hard to make sure that the reader could understand what is said without being ethnocentric by adapting it and using French equivalents. And this is still something that we need to discuss and talk about. Thank you. So, Anna? I'm, yes, I'm here. <laughs> okay. Um, hi everyone, so I am mostly going to talk about words or phrases that we had trouble translating in the novel, um, even as a group, because we had different opinions about um, how to translate them or about how or what these words or phrases meant in English to begin with. So to start at the very beginning, I'm going to talk about the title of the book that is actually um, yet to be decided. So we started off of Professor Schmidt's proposition of um, la nostalgie as a translation for uh, the yearning, which most of us agreed on, even though um, we suspected it might give us a hard time later since the word yearning is repeated several times throughout the book. So the word we were to choose had to go with the context every single time and that was over 20 times. So we had to take into account over 20 different sentences while choosing the right word. We um, also looked for the translation of the word yearning in the Bible, just to try to keep any religious overtone the word might have. Um, and we ended up finding frémissement des entrailles, um, et mes entrailles qui frémissent, which literally translates to shivering of guts. Which, which didn't work out for obvious reasons. 
Um, then there was the proposition of the word la quête, which translates to the quest in English, which as opposed to nostalgia, who can only refer to the past, can be applied to the future as well. And we do have the phrase um, yearning for the future in the novel, the goddess to rethink nostalgia as a translation for yearning. Um, but setting aside all the recurrences of the word in the novel, we still need to think about whether la quête would sell or not. Um, so this is briefly why the title is yet to be decided, mostly because there's a lot of factors to take into account and we believe we need to give it more thought because the title is probably one of the most important, if not the most important element in the book, publishing wise at least. Um, and then moving on to the dialogues, the most recurring problem as Professor Schmidt and Noemi stated in their presentations was of course that of the words in South African languages and how it, um, how it affected our understanding of certain phrases, like um, when are you going to come and help Kadi arrangement? I'm doing the flowers, but it would be nice if you could help. Um, the word arrangement here was not easy to translate because some of us thought it was a flower arrangement because of the reference to flowers and I'm doing the flowers. And others thought it was the organization of the event in general, and the two meanings would translate to two com completely different words in French. But after asking Ms. Mashigo, we learned that it was the preparations for the event in general. Um, another example for the same issue with the dialogue is Shu, I raise Niguana, O selfish Watseba. Here, um, the mother is addressing Marubini after asking her to help with the event preparations and basically telling her to leave her work to do so. And the issue here is even though we were specifically told to, to leave the words in Sepeti and not translate them, um, um, we, is that we didn't know um, if whether French grammar would apply to the sentence if we leave every word as it is. For example, um, Niguana O means this child. Niguana meaning child and O meaning this. So as you can see, the demonstrative and the noun are inverted. So we're not sure whether je neguana o um, egoist would be better, or maybe just translate the o, so it would be je elve set neguana egoiste, which can be more understandable linguistically, at least to French readers. Um, I mean, you can immediately understand that neguana means child or daughter, as opposed to je elve neguana o atseba, where it is, um, I guess, less apparent. Another example is ma, which is how Marabini calls her mother. So in French, there is maman, which normally translates to mom in English and would fit just fine here. But we decided it was best to keep how Marabini called all her family members. So ma, baba, and go, go. Um, and we were right to do so because later on, she talked about how her brother called their mother mom. Um, so we would have needed to keep ma to show, to show the difference between the two, mom and ma. But for Gogo, for instance, that meant grandmother, we weren't sure about keeping it at first because we weren't sure it would be clear enough to the readers that Gogo and M's grandmother were the same person. But we eventually decided to keep it since Gogo was repeated over 120 times throughout the book. So we figured it would be okay to leave it as it is. And we think it was obvious enough in the book that it refers to the grandmother. So we kept it. Um, another minor issue here was that of the culinary references like soft porridge and pop and chicken. Um, our, our opinions were divided for the first one between keeping soft porridge as it is or translating it literally to be porridge du, for example, or giving it a more explicit equivalent like, um, um, like a porridge de sorgho or um, bouilli de maïs for pop and chicken. The same three options for pop and chicken but it is yet to be decided as well. So um, this is the end of the examples we decided to go over today because they don't need a lot of context to be understood by everyone watching us. But I guess um, a lot of things helped that we didn't have plenty of issues in the translation of the book or complete blanks at least, because for one, having an extra set of eyes always helps you see things you probably wouldn't notice right away let alone if you have 20 people translating the same text, although it takes relatively more time to choose the best sentence in every single passage of the book. 
but um, it's like having 20 readers giving you their opinion on the spot while you're translating. You got to see right away if it works, um, if it's understandable, if um, the translation is as captivating as the original book. And on the other hand, having the author at reach, I believe, is the biggest asset, especially for a multicultural or a hybrid book like The Earning, because whenever we're not sure which way to go, we can just ask the author what they prefer, and there you have it. Thank you. Okay. Merci. Je prends le temps de lire un extrait de notre, de notre traduction, peut-être Absolument, absolument, Barbara, oui. Merci. Alors, je vais, euh, vais m'y mettre. Alors, c'est un extrait, c'est au début du texte, quand, euh, quand la, la grand-mère euh, grand de Maroubini euh, lui raconte pour la xième fois euh, l'histoire de sa naissance. Donc, c'est une histoire qu'elle lui raconte. Donc, c'est la grand-mère qui parle, qui parle à Maroubini et qui lui raconte pour la énième fois, le jour de son anniversaire, l'histoire de sa naissance. Et c'est un passage très important parce que, euh, C'est une histoire qui, qui fait que Maroubini se sent, se sent spéciale. Ta mère Makocha était assise sur le step, le step et elle se faisait les dents sur un caillou. Ma pauvre fille était enceinte jusqu'aux yeux, elle n'était vraiment pas bien. On était persuadés que tu serais un garçon car la grossesse l'avait vraiment enlaidi. Toko faisait cuire quelque chose qui sentait fort dans la cuisine, si bien que je me suis assise sur le step. Maman, j'ai peur, a-t-elle seulement pu me dire. Toko s'est détourné de sa concoction odorante pour venir me saluer. « Notre petit-fils ou notre petite-fille veut rester bien au chaud, dis-moi. » Jaboulani s'affairait à porter mes bagages dans leur seconde chambre, tandis qu'on se moquait gentiment de Kocha en soulignant combien tu l'enlaidissais. Les gens de Soweto se plaignaient de la forte chaleur. Moi, je vis dans la chaleur. J'y fais pousser ma nourriture. J'ai même élevé un enfant sous ce soleil implacable. Toko a dit qu'il allait bientôt pleuvoir. Il n'y avait pas un nuage à l'horizon, mais je l'ai cru. Ta mère venait de commencer son jardin. Le soleil l'empêchait de fleurir. « Il n'a pas plu depuis des semaines. C'est rare en été à Johannesburg », a dit Makocha pour expliquer le pitoyable état de son jardin. Toko lui a apporté une tasse de son bouillon odorant et s'est assise à mes côtés. Nous sommes restés là, toutes les trois, à regarder en silence le jardin pathétique de ta mère. Toko m'a regardé et m'a dit « Je disais juste à Makocha que Jaboulani pouvait aider à faire venir le bébé, mais elle n'a pas l'air convaincue. J'ai souri car Makocha détestait parler de sexe avec moi. Elle savait exactement quelle serait ma réaction à la remarque de Toko. « Oh, s'il vous plaît, Mme Toko, ne lancez pas ma mère là-dessus » a-t-elle répondu, du gravier rouge dans la bouche. Quand elle était enceinte de toi, elle avait une envie irrépressible de sentir le goût de la terre, plus que tout autre. J'ai souri et sorti des cacahuètes de ma poche. Toko disait pile ce que j'avais moi-même expliqué à ta mère. Juste avant que ton père ne vienne me chercher, J'étais en train de dire à une voisine que le sexe était la meilleure technique pour te faire venir plus vite. C'est une recette connue pour déclencher une naissance. « Maman, les infirmières de la clinique m'ont dit qu'il suffisait que je marche. Que tu marches où Et tu préfères écouter les infirmières que ta propre mère, alors que des centaines de femmes m'ont confié leur fille. »« Aïe, Maria, tu sais bien que les enfants ne font jamais confiance à leurs parents. » Allons lancé Toko en faisant signe à sa bru de boire la concoction. Makocha a repoussé la tasse et tenté de se lever. Sa robe était mouillée. Le bébé arrive. « Jabou !»« Ah, ma fille !» Elle a beau être entourée de femmes venues l'aider à, à accoucher, mais elle appelle son mari. Jabou est sorti en courant de la maison, mais Toko lui a fait signe de rester à l'écart, et elle m'a aidé à emmener ta mère dans la chambre. Oh, cette scène qu'elle nous a faite Elle hurlait qu'elle voulait voir son mari, et se comportait comme si elle était la première femme au monde à donner la vie. Toko l'a prise par le visage, l'a regardée dans les yeux. « Ce n'est pas un endroit pour un homme. Ses douleurs vont s'intensifier, « Mais ton bébé et toi savaient exactement ce qu'il faut faire, Sissi. » Ta mère a semblé se calmer un peu. J'étais debout à la fenêtre de la seconde chambre que Toko avait préparée pour nous. « Ne t'inquiète pas, Wena Toko. Cette tête de mule n'est pas encore prête à arriver. Laisse ma cocha hurler jusqu'à ce qu'elle n'en puisse plus. » Finalement, ta mère a arrêté de pleurer et nous lui avons expliqué exactement ce qui allait se passer. Ces choses, elle les avait déjà entendues, mais elle lui faisait soudain peur. Ce qui s'est ensuite passé, personne ne peut l'expliquer. Je savais que tu étais sur le point de sortir. Et la chambre s'est assombrie tout d'un coup. Toko se tenait à la fenêtre. Elle a dit qu'il allait pleuvoir. Impossible de savoir, bien sûr. Mais j'ai eu l'impression que tu es sorti au moment même où la pluie a commencé à toucher le sol. Euh, j'ai perdu la ligne. L'IPAD a fait une bêtise. Au moment même où la pluie a commencé à toucher le sol. La tête de mule était finalement une fille. Ta mère t'a regardé rapidement et s'est de nouveau mise à pleurer. 
tu étais enfin arrivée et tu étais vivante, tu respirais, tu hurlais, tu babillais et tu étais magnifique. » Voilà, alors c'est une première étape hein, de, la, de la traduction, mais c'est un, un passage qu'on a, qu a traduit avec le groupe notamment des, des étudiants de, de Master Bilingue. Merci beaucoup euh, Barbara, merci à Anna et Noémie euh, pour votre excellente présentation qui montre bien les difficultés effectivement de, de traduire euh, un texte euh, avec autant de références culturelles, euh, avec euh, voilà, une telle richesse. Euh, Est-ce qu'il y a des, des premières questions Moi j'ai déjà des, des questions, mais je ne sais pas s'il y a des questions euh, euh, de la part des auditeurs euh, Andrea mentionnait qu'elle était, euh, que c'était fascinant de vous avoir entendu, euh, d'avoir euh, voilà, entendu les difficultés aussi et la manière dont on doit être très attentif à tout ce qui est dit. Euh, Georges a mentionné aussi la référence à, à Step, hein, Stoep, ce qui est Stoop. Apparemment, on a compris. Voilà, J'avais pas vérifié euh, la prononciation. Voilà, donc il nous disait, c'est vrai que c'est un des mots qu'on qu euh, qu qu trouve dans le, dans le texte et qui a été gardé. Oui. Euh, donc peut-être, je ne sais pas si euh, vous voulez en dire un peu plus par rapport à ça ou euh, à ce mot-là, par exemple, ou euh, pourquoi le choix de le garder, euh, par exemple. Alors, Alors le, le mot « stoop ouais. » est un mot qui revient tout le temps dans la littérature sud-africaine et que j'ai beaucoup de mal à traduire. Ouais. Alors, le mot qui est le plus proche en français, ce serait la « varangue », telle ouais. qu'on la trouve à la Réunion ou dans les Antilles. On m'a aussi dit, tu pourrais prendre au vent, mais un au vent ne, ne couvre pas forcément deux ou trois côtés de la maison. Un, un, un stoop peut être très, très grand et c'est là où on se tient parce qu'il fait chaud, c'est là où on reçoit les gens, c'est un, un endroit très, très convivial. Donc, on peut laisser stoop et, euh, et peut-être mettre en fin de, de livre un glossaire, mais le stoop, c'est vraiment très, très sud-africain. On le trouve vraiment dans, dans beaucoup de romans sud-africains, c'est vrai, hein, c'est quelque chose. Partout. Mais on a le même oui. problème en anglais américain avec, quel est le mot en anglais américain, qui est si difficile à traduire aussi, qui, qui correspond à peu près à la même chose. Et la... Non, <rire> je ne trouve plus tout d'un coup. Parce qu'alors, euh, euh, le, le, oui, le, le porch, bien sûr, le porch. Un jour, à Gallimard, on m'a dit « mais non, il faut traduire ça par véranda ». Mais non, véranda, non. chez nous, il y a du verre, ce oui, n'est pas possible. C'est un espace complètement ouvert, ouvert au vent, donc ce n'est oui. pas du tout ça. Oui. Alors, puisqu'on en est à prononcer les choses, puisque vous êtes des gens tout à fait euh, cultivés, prière de dire « John ». Kutsé, c'est un, un patronyme africain, c'est le O-E, se prononce ou comme en néerlandais, comme la guerre des bourgs, etc. Donc, euh, pas de Kutsé, de Kutz, de, enfin bon, on en va, va Kutsé. Voilà, mais ça vous le saviez, mais je, je, je tiens à le préciser. Merci, merci beaucoup. Um, Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions Est-ce que we can also move on to English as well if, um, if Mohale or Andrea would like to intervene? Um, I think I had a question about the, the title, I guess, which we all uh, talking about and wondering how to how to translate. And we thought that um, you've thought of La Quête, um, uh, which indeed sort of um, embodies what is said in the yearning, but with a different uh, sonority, which is the, the issue. It's not as soft and and sweet as the yearning. Um, and I guess the, the publisher and, and maybe Andrea could um, intervene as well, has a say in the title. I guess we, we suggest titles to publishers, but they also have a say uh, in, in, in the choice of the title. Even though I think that the yearning was something that Mohali chose, um, if I remember well, but. Yes, uh, it was a manuscript that very much came with the title The Yearning, and in our South African context, it's absolutely perfect. Um, mm. So much meaning packed into it. Uh, mm. I can well appreciate that it's not an easy no. concept to translate because it's made up of multiple, um, yeah, multiple concepts, actually. Mm. Mm. The most fascinating thing when uh, Barbara told me that there is no translation, like a direct translation oh. for the yearning, something I'd never considered. So this whole process of translating, um, it's the first time I've ever been involved in, in this capacity in translating. And it's so good to see the kind of care that everyone is putting into this translation. It's really, it's really, really nice to see. 
Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you, Mohani. Uh, I see we have a question, uh, quite a few questions coming up. So I guess um, Barbara, you can see them, but I can also read them out if you if you wish. Um, pour ce genre de terme, est-ce que cela pose vraiment problème de laisser le mot tel quel um, En tant que lectrice, je vais voir sur Internet à quoi ça ressemble. Ça interrompt la lecture, mais permet de se plonger dans un univers qui n'est pas le nôtre et de se représenter plus facilement les choses. I guess it's all a question about keeping uh, the words as they are, having uh, yeah. a glossary at the end, having footnotes. It's, um, uh, it's a question that we often ask ourselves as yeah. translators, yeah. Yeah, that's the choice we've made, uh, keep re keeping the words as they are, uh, mm. so as to be, uh, uh, so as to be um, in the South African reality. Well, it's a choice. I don't know, but it's the choice we've made, yes. Mm. Mm. You should keep it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely think so. <laughs> yeah, and I think Moeli agree, agreed with that as well. Yeah. We, we discussed yeah. it with, with her, of, of course, yeah. and she... Yes. Um, and then we've got a question from Ludovic Diaz, uh, one of our students. Uh, translating silences is tough. What about the musicality of a book? Mm -hmm. He says, I'm thinking, for example, of Caribbean Calypso, mm -hmm. uh, those French work. Yeah, well, that's a, a question. Speaking of musicality, this is why I don't like the quest, by the way, because the yearning is, well, it's completely different. It's a different... Uh, a different musicality and um, and um, and yes that will be a, that will be a question but this is for, for stage two this is not for stage one <laughs> so we are not currently working on it uh, but definitely yes um, George yeah, yeah yeah George I think he's yes got a uh, I would like to ask to Mohali what she thinks about Afrikaans because it was mentioned that Afrikaans is uh, uh, charged with being the language of apartheid, but uh, it would be um, misunderstanding to reduce it to it. It would be like saying, oh, let's not learn German because it was the language of the Nazis. So yeah. that's why it's uh, um, you have to be cautious. So uh, I'd like to know, Mohali, uh, 40 years after the Soweto riots, which was about Afrikaans, how do young people react now towards Afrikaans? Well, I, I can't speak for all young people, but there is definitely a division for some who feel that it's the language of the oppressor and others who know that Afrikaans has got a very, um, it's layered because there are a lot of, um, this is a word we only use in South Africa, there are a lot of colored people whose first language is Afrikaans and that would be taking away from their heritage. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very, it's a very layered um, discussion that, but there are also some people that are uh, well aware of the fact that Afrikaans was uh, kind of like a, a Creole that was born from um, the slaves who were working in the Western Cape at the time, and it's got some Dutch and it's got some Malay. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm a lover of languages, so I, I love languages and I, I love listening to people speak languages and I, I love the nuances of language. So for me, I don't have a problem with Afrikaans. I'm very well aware of its, um, its being used in a violent way by a violent regime. But I know people personally who, who are not white Afrikaans people and that's their mother tongue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, George, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Is that, well, is that, yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> you want me to add something? Uh, no, I was wondering if it, if it was. Um, if no, it it's was okay. I don't know about the light, but uh, uh, just oh, to yeah. mention that Afrikaans, I remember those ANC uh, 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 militants I met in, in, in Europe who used to speak Afrikaans between themselves in order not to be listened by. You know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting, the, 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 the relation towards Afrikaans, which is indeed complicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, we had another uh, remark from Antonella, one of our colleagues, who says that she thought of the, the, the word calling that appears at the end of the volume, whether it could be I guess Antonella, you wanted to say whether it could be a possible title, or, or you want you wondered about the meaning of the word calling. I don't know if you would like to uh, 
uh, specify. I'm not sure what she what she meant. Um, yes, she thought as a title uh, for the yearning as well. Whether we thought about that or. Yeah. Mohali explained that the calling was uh, an alternative title, if I remember well, because the calling is the calling uh, to be to be a healer. Yeah. Yes. So that was one of the options um, really early on, and I just felt that it was um, it, it reduced the story yeah. to just, just that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah. But I don't know if in, in French it would have a, a, a different context. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. in, in the in the South African context, I just... Mm. Yes, yeah, Lapel, why not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess it's, there's more liquid, but I don't know if it's nicer, if it's more... Yeah, it's more specific mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. this in particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, I don't know how it would translate in, in the prologue, um, yeah. the yearning... Him. That's the problem. The it's yearning the hurts me. Mm. Mm. Why have you used the yearning in the prologue? <laughs> would, it be, would it have been so easy for us? <laughs> yeah. Um, so maybe you could um, discuss, I, I was wondering about, you talked so a lot about collective translation, of course, between all of you, I wonder, Noemi and Anna, what you've learned from this collective translation. I guess it is the first time that you have translated collectively. Um, and I wonder if that's something that George has ever done as a translator because he's used to translating. So whether he's ever translated collectively with other people. Or, um, but maybe Noemi and Anna, what you've, what you've learned from this collective translation, this work, uh, this collective work that you've done. Um, if you've if you've um, liked working as in a group or what you've learned in particular, um. uh, yes, definitely. It was very interesting, and we learned a lot. And it was really important to have several people, and they all uh, had different ideas, and mm. they all understood the text in different ways. So sometimes when we didn't know. Uh, how to translate the sentence and people mm. kept um, giving ideas and little by little we agreed to a solution that was really great and that everybody liked. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we couldn't have translated the text all alone, mm. but together it was really nice and I'm mm. really proud to be part of the project. Okay, okay. thank you Naomi. Um, George, I don't know if you've ever if you've ever done any collective translation or translated with someone else, or whether you you tend yes. to translate on your own. <laughs> we had an experience of collective translation uh, of two South African poets, Tatamkulu Africa and Anki Kroch. So the the poets would read in their mother language, and then I would translate word by word, and then the other poets who, we who were in the room. Uh, would make proposals and finally we could reach for an agreement. But it's a very, very long process. I think we did in, in three days, we, we translated six poems, something like that. Mm -hmm. By the way, how far are you with the translation of the yearning? Oh, well, normally stage one will be over in uh, mid-January. Uh, that is the first translation, and mm -hmm. uh, we'll keep the, the second semester to work on the rewriting. So mm -hmm. it took us uh, about a year uh, last time, not not uh, not for this one, but for Safranco's uh, The Suicide, mm -hmm. it took us about the, the whole academic year. Yeah. Good, mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I guess it's translated uh, within classes, but also uh, there's some group groups working on different sections of the book and then uh, Barbara is collating things together um, and um, and then we all be reading uh, the final um, the final manuscript um, so um, I don't know if there's any more questions from the from the viewers I guess it's already uh, quite late uh, but because we started a bit late we could take another one or two questions if you not too hungry um, so if there's another another question for um, or, or if you, between yourselves, if you've got any question, or Andrea, if you'd like to come back, and or Mohali, uh, and ask any, if you have any questions. Um, 
I guess that I see um, Monica who is, um, who is complaining about Mohali not thinking about the translators with <laughs> the hard work she's giving to the translators. <laughs> but when she wrote this book, I guess she didn't think about that. I guess she didn't think about <laughs> the translation part of your work. But I think you said that it was, it's already been translated, I think you said, Mohali, or it's being translated into Arabic, is that right? Yes, it is. Andrea yeah. would know how far along they are in the process, I think, with the Arabic translation. And Portuguese. Yes, both. Um, um, and uh, they are, as far as I'm aware, they have finished the first round, as it were. Um, they were getting some external readers to have a look at it um, in, in Arabic. I'm, I'm sure that whatever language you're translating into, you're going to be coming up against these same kinds of issues. Yeah. Um, and and it's it's really intriguing to to think about how in the different languages you are are going to deal with with the challenges that you get presented. Um, I think they're hoping to publish um, in the second half of 2021 on both of those, the Portuguese and the Arabic. So that'll be exciting to see. Mm -hmm. And Monica is asking whether the other translators, so Arabic in Arabic and Portuguese, contact you to ask questions. I guess you or, or Mohali, uh, rather. So sometimes um, they do uh, to ask for context or to explain something in particular. Um, usually they send those queries to the publisher and then we'd pass them on to the author. Um, I must say we haven't actually had that process um, happen at this point in time. So maybe it'd be a good idea to touch base with everyone just to make sure <laughs> that, they, that they are managing um, and feel like they're coping adequately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think if there's no more questions, I don't know if you wanted to, anyone wanted to add anything. Um, I guess we can uh, we can stop the session here. Many thanks again to our speakers for a very thought provoking session on translating and publishing. And thanks a lot um, to all of you for attending this closing session. Uh, thank you also for coming on Teams. It will be uh, put on YouTube a bit later, so you'll be able to view it again for those who, who would like to watch it again, or for those who haven't been able to join us today. Please follow our program uh, on our Ariel website um, and all the well-known social networks, uh, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Don't hesitate to watch the all Ariel series on YouTube. N'hésitez pas à acheter les livres de Moali, et notamment The Yearning, en anglais ou en français, when it will be published, when it is published, quand il sera publié. Thank you again. Bye for now and please take care. Thank you very much. Bye bye.